intention when I started this project he wasn't going to leave me alone he wanted me to pick apart everything so by learning dependent origination it wasn't enough <laughs> he wanted me to then talk about the red zone on the chart and the red zone has to do if you have the color chart the red zone is from the point of craving craving clinging uh, habitual tendencies, and then the birth of reaction, and then the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So we're going to look at that. And we're going to look first. We're going to go, before we go into what I wrote, we're going to just look at um, sutta number nine. And this is Samad Samaditi Sutta. And the Samaditi Sutta is interesting because it is taking you uh, in the direction, if we haven't talked about this before, you might not understand what this, the importance of this, but when the Buddha uh, talks about dependent origination, we know when we examine the text that in the Samyutta Nikaya, he theoretically figured it out with an intellectual form of uh, deductive reasoning and in the Brahmin custom they call this neti neti and it means in English deductive reasoning now the Christians use the same thing they call it the negativita where you go from the, the where you start with the question down 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 and say if that's there why is that there oh because of this if that's there why is that true because of this if that's true what is true because of this and it keeps going until there's nothing left this is how he figured it out so sometime i can read you that section on the origination and then uh, the disappearance of the suffering and how he figured it out was to start with aging and death. He didn't start with ignorance. He started with aging and death. And this sutta is nice because it does that too. I'm not going to do the whole sutta. I'm just going to try to show you um, a little bit of the direction where this was. And um, to give you a feel of what he was doing with this whole teaching is emphasized in the sutta also. So I'll start in the piece in the beginning and then just a, one page in for one spot. So thus I have heard the Samaditi Sutta, right view, Majima Nikai number nine. It's on page 132 if you have the book. Thus I have heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindaka's Park. And there the venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus thus and said, friends, and friend, they replied. Everybody called each other friend in the monastic system in the beginning, in the beginning. Okay, the venerable Sariputta said this. So the, actually the Sariputta is teaching this lesson. One of right view, one of right view, friends. In what way is a noble disciple one of right view? whose view is straight and who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Indeed, friend, we would come from far away to learn the Venerable Sariputta, the meaning of the statement. It would be good if he would explain the meaning of the statement. Then friends, listen carefully and attend closely to what I shall say. And then he starts to teach this lesson and he's He's restating 
the, the basis of all of the Buddhist teaching is the discovery of what happens if you make a decision to live on the wholesome instead of the unwholesome side. It's the reason for the dana and sila training. And the dana is the opening of the heart. The sila is for the guidance of the, of the, um, the morality and ethics underneath the teaching. And so he's teaching wholesome versus unwholesome. He talks about this first. And in part five, uh, he, this is where he's emphasizing the reason for the, the, uh, the sila. But I like it when what is the root of the unwholesome? Greed is the root of the unwholesome. Hate is the root of the unwholesome. Delusion is the root of the unwholesome. So this, um, these three poisons, loba dosa moha, we hear jumping in here. And we have to understand the greed, what it is, the I like it, I want it attachment. That's what the craving is, you see? But the hatred is, I don't like it, I don't want it, and I want to make this stop. And we get frustrated that way. And the delusion means the false idea that when all this is happening, it is me, it is mine, it is myself, and it's not just a process that's happening. And he's trying to explain this, this cognitive psychological process that the human being has 2,600 years ago. Ooh. <laughs> and he has it right on the mark. He has it with 12 pieces that he explains how this works. He doesn't have to make it 27 or 32 the way they're doing in research today, and maybe we'll go up to 40 before they quit. Who knows? But the average person can learn what I'm gonna show you about how the suffering works. That's what's really important. So the other part of this is the root of the wholesome is non-greed and um, is the root of the wholesome, and non-hate is the root of the wholesome, non-delusion is the root of the wholesome. Aha, so we have to swing around our perception, our perceiving of the idea, our perspective of falling into, it's my fault, I did it, I have to carry the blame, and I have to uh, blame myself and be guilty. So let go of all that. He's saying let go of all that. Uh, Non-delusion. Delusion is when you think everything's your fault. I've made a mess of everything. Boy, am I dumb. I'm never going to get to the top. And you just keep doing that. And I know some people, they just love it. The moment the thought comes up, they sit with it all day long. They don't do any work at all. And then they say, oh, I'm so confused. And I'm so oh, lost in life. You're lost in life because... You're grabbing hold of something that is so negative and just feeding it, feeding it the negative feelings, okay? So when we flip over, in, this is going through from, uh, this is what I'm saying, from death and aging and death in the sutta on page 135 to 136, back to birth is the cause of it, back to clinging, back to without clean craving. But I'm showing you first the direction I'm teaching you how this gets you into the trouble of the suffering. So in craving, I'm just going to read the small section on this. The bhikkhus were delighted and rejoiced in what the venerable Sariputta's words were. And then they asked him for a further question, but friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view and has arrived at the true Dhamma. There might be, friend. When, friends, a noble disciple understands craving, the origin of the craving, the cessation of the craving, and the way that's leading to the cessation of the craving, in that way he is one of right view or a harmonious perspective. Harmonious, not taking it personally, not taking everything on yourself and worrying about something that happened back there and staying in the present time, clearly working in the present time. That's the big one, isn't it? Okay. And he has arrived at the true Dhamma. When and what is craving? 
What is the origin of the craving? What is the cessation of the craving? What is the path leading to the cessation of the craving? Now you see this. This is the Four Noble Truths as being used for a method of investigation. That's what the Four Noble Truths were before he was enlightened. He was using those steps. That's why he wants you to use those steps yourself and carry them through. Well, there are these six classes of craving. Craving of forms, craving of sounds, craving for the odors, craving for the flavors, craving for the tangibles, craving for mind objects. With the arising of feeling, there is the arising of the craving. And with the cessation of the feeling, there's the cessation of craving. The way leading to the cessation of craving is just the Noble Eightfold Path. And then it goes into the Eightfold Path as showing you uh, the support system. And if you look at the, the part we taught about the meditation, you'll see how that's all involved in supporting the meditation. So what is all I'm gonna use the text for right now, and I wanna go get into what was uh, decided as being the, the right thing to do about this, um, the craving. So we start out by saying, when we have to examine craving, we start out by saying, what is the craving? And it seems like a simple question, but I don't know why people don't ask it more. <laughs> I had to think about that. And in America, when Westerners go, and they certainly, when they go and listen to any Asian teacher at all, I don't care how old or how young or who they are. If they're from Asia, they must know everything and we should accept what they say and not question. And they sit in a room with a lot of other Asian people in Chinese monasteries and things like that, or. I went into, uh, I saw this happen in California in the, uh, uh, you know, in the um, Cambodian temple in Los Angeles. And, and then a lot of the Thai temples, it always works this way. Westerners, a lot of times, will sit there with the, the Asians who don't ask questions out of respect, and they were raised as Buddhists. And then we don't ask questions, and we don't find out a very basic answer to this question. What is craving? Now, I think I told you that one of the things Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation does is it tries to develop the easiest definitions for you to remember, to support, and to got, remind you about your meditation. So when you get to a cognitive link of craving, this is an important link to remember in your meditation. We have often heard about it as simply meaning just a flippant answer, desire. Craving is desire. But there's a few problems with that because there's wholesome desire and there's unwholesome desire in the lay person's life. Obviously, the wholesome desire to follow your precepts, to keep your practice going, to be successful as a family, to have good relationships, good grades in school, successful in your life's work, and let, you know, let's keep that going. That's all important for a peaceful life and peaceful coexistence, any place. But desire involved with early sen uh, sensual pleasures and unwholesome ideas and directions, on the other hand, is not such a good idea and is going breaking precepts and drinking and all kinds of things and going overboard with things is not such a good idea. And when we first begin training, this is, it also doesn't explain enough for you because if you want to let go of this craving, think about this for just a minute. Think first that it's a good idea for me to tell you more precisely what it is that, so that you can let go of it. That's the trick, isn't it? Especially if you're gonna say craving is the cause of the suffering. So we worked pretty hard over about 20 years time. Bhante had ideas and he let us think of our own with a descriptive definition that helps us to get in touch with exactly what the state is like and how it happens in the meditation and in life. 
So this kind of definition for craving, tanha goes like this, that we want you to memorize it. And then we want you to start to watch it all the time around you. Craving always manifests as tension and tightness arising in the mind and in the body. It is the I like it and the I don't like it mind. When you start to watch this in life, it gets very interesting. Uh, this turns out to be pretty clear because craving has a feeling that arises and it signals it is arriving. And it had a mind condition that gives it away. And that's our cue to let go and relax, isn't it? And the student is trained to notice these signals that tell them their body and mind slightly changed following contact and feeling. Something happens at this point because once we know what this is, the signal, then mind begins to calm down. It stops jumping around. I always find it fascinating when all we have to know is how something works and all of a sudden we're not afraid of it anymore. You know? Um, in the Wizard of Oz with the West Witch, we need, all we needed to get rid of the witch was a bucket of water. <laughs> we threw the bucket of water on the West Witch and she melted. <laughs> But we didn't know for a long time that's how to do it in the story. Remember the six R's? Well, yeah, uh, I try to keep them going now, says Q. Good Q, because Buddhist meditation practice is actually a mind yoga. It trains us to see how mind's attention moves from one object to another. This is very important to see what happens first, what happens second, what holds the secret of heavy suffering. As mind's attention moves, as the tension level shifts, this gives the student a signal to release and relax first before flowing through all of the six R's. Let's go over the six R's one more time. Okay, how do they run? And Q tells me what he's learned. Recognize how mind's attention moves off the object of meditation or the task that you're doing in life. Recognize that and then release whatever is beginning to distract you and just let it be there. Then you relax in the mind, in the head. You left over tension in mind and body. Relax the head. Okay, right. Do this in one flowing motion. No longer than three seconds for all six of these. Let's say that out loud to yourself a few times. No longer than three seconds to run these six steps. Five of them, really. And then you re-smile. Why? To lighten up mind and sharpen the awareness as you gently return mind's attention back to the object of meditation and you keep the wholesome meditation going. Okay, right. Repeat the cycle only as needed, which means that something is beginning to distract you. And he says, got it. Okay, so the entire cycle should run through like rolling your R's like that. That's how you train yourself, it just rolls through. It runs like this in a maximum of three seconds. To begin with, recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, and then repeat as necessary. The cycle is the same as keeping a harmonious practice going to fulfill the fold of the eightfold path that's called right effort. You keep doing this in the same way every time to retrain your brain. That's what you're doing with this practice. And Q says, well, so how is the craving identified in the body? Craving is like a tiny jerk. And as energy first kicks in, 
to cause an increase in tension and tightness in the body and the mind. When the opinion hits, I don't like it. That's an increase, it's a jerk. As soon as that comes into it. This change in tension and tightness is the hallmark telling you that craving just arrived and it needs to be released. Do you remember that I told you that when we meditate, we are attempting to investigate a state of no tension and tightness? Yes. In order to understand the importance of letting go here, we have to understand what is going on. To do this, we have to take a look at the brain. The presence or absence of tension in the brain can be seen with equipment that monitors the brain. Time for anatomy now, just a little bit. Looking at the brain, there are two lobes that are there, here and here. Auntie goes like this and talks about these two lobes, okay? The two lobes are surrounded by a thin membrane called the meninges. Well, anytime mind's attention is disturbed, tension arises. The meninges surrounding the brain is not a muscle. I want to make sure you understand that. In some of the older talks, we didn't understand that. And we said that the sat, the, the, this is co contracting around the lobe. That's not what's happening. The meninges is described in your anatomy books as a sac. When we start to think the gray matter in your brain very slightly it swells and presses against the sac the sac is being pressed and this is tightening and this is what you are learning to notice now when you first notice a change in the facial expression when tensions arise in meditations uh, retreats i can sit in the front and observe you practicing in a group of 30, 40 people, I can see when a person actually stops observing and starts to try to make something stop that's in their mind. They're just sitting there like this, you know, very, uh, just sitting there like this, and they'll start to squint here and tighten around the mouth, and then you'll see sometimes the neck tightening, okay? When you're watching somebody uh, who has something they dislike in, an, in a train station or an airport and they're standing in line and they're irritated because they're standing in line, okay? You can see them start to get upset by the tightening of their hands first. If you can't see their face, they're gonna, their hands are, instead of being relaxed, their hands are gonna be like this, tight. So this is the first place that we get to see it in the body of the person. You can see it in their eyes if they are not smiling. You can watch their eyes, but the squinting of the eyes, if they're not smiling, then they squint their eyes and purse their, the, between their eyes. As we perform the relaxed step to release the tension and tightness, the membrane loosens, and eventually the student senses the slight separation between the lobes that occurs. You're not gonna see this right away when you're starting out, but the quieter and deeper you go, the more still and the longer you sit to watch. Then if you peek at what's happening in your head, you can notice this very clearly. And if we move mind's attention back to the object of meditation, while it is relaxed like this, then we can feel mind drop down a little deeper each time to do uh, that we allow for each time we do this it allows for a deeper investigation time in the beginning time can be 30 minutes time can be an hour when you get beyond the fourth jhana time is important and the point where you will fall over into the deepest states starts to be two or three hours but we have students now that are just starting who are telling us that I came out and I had no idea it was longer than 10 minutes and it was like almost an hour. So they're already learning very quickly that if you're very still and you don't move, then time changes inside. Time's hypothetical anyway. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. If we move mind's attention back 
uh, when it's relaxed like this, then we feel the mind drop. And that's what's important to eventually realize this is really true. On the night of his enlightenment, it is suspected that the Buddha decided to tranquilize his bodily formation and his mental formation. And perhaps this is what changed uh, within the Buddhist practice so that he could fall over into the Naroda Samupati, okay, the final, the final deepest uh, experience of the cessation. And finally, he was able to experience the aware jhanas. And he realized once he did it that night, after that, he realized you didn't need all this tension to get into these deeper states. And we like to think we're not doing that, but it starts doing that up here. So instead of talking just about what's happening with the body, we're going to the source. And mind is the forerunner of all states, so why not go to the source? And that's what he did. Finally, he was able to see these aware jhanas as he described them in the Anupada Sutta by applying the tranquilization steps. We think that that is, not, is what he was not practicing before. So this was a new idea. It was different from his earlier experience in the absorption jhana states. And um, this explains how the Buddha entered into the deeper states with a full kind of awareness. And this aware jhana, this is also when I say aware, uh, aware, full awareness, I'm saying insights can happen when you're doing it this way. They can't happen, it's absolutely true, unless you come out to do it from the other way. So it, rather than the two steps, we think this is what happened and it's very reasonable to say this is what's happening when you listen and you read certain suttas, number 36. Read number 36, start reading from section 30. And I might do that for you in a minute if, you, if we have a chance. Okay, allowed him to realize more information about these levels and understanding. And later he taught people how this could be useful in daily life and it helped them to reduce their suffering. How useful the practice becomes for each person is determined by the degree the person sticks to the instructions for the practice. Doesn't add anything else. If you want to understand that better, you go to Sutta number 72 in section 18, where Vacha is being talked to by the uh, Buddha, and he's, he's being told straight out, you know, he was trying to tell the Buddha, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I do this way and I do that. And the Buddha is just trying to give him instructions. And then all of a sudden he says to Vacha, it's enough to cause you bewilderment, Vacha, enough to cause you confusion. The Dhamma is profound. It's hard to see and hard to understand. It's peaceful and it's sublime unattainable by mere reasoning. That means getting in a book or just reasoning things out intellectually, it is unattainable. It is very subtle to be experienced by the wise. That means someone who understands the dependent origination and can understand how the suffering is happening. It is hard for you to understand it when you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve of another teaching, pursue a different training, and follow a different teacher. So I shall begin to question you about this in return. And then he goes into a discussion with him to try to get him to understand. Yes, I found it. Yes, I, I can show you how to do it, but only if you follow exactly what I said. So don't change the recipe to the chocolate cake. Don't do it. <laughs> Use the right flour, the right butter, the right ingredients. Don't use a different oil if it's in the recipe. This is the secret, and that was what happened with the meditation too. Okay, question. Can you tell me more about the craving? Well, yep, I can. Craving is the first personal opinion that occurs in the human a line of human cognition where I enters into the uh, equation. Right at craving, 
he, I becomes the star of the show. All of a sudden, I am there. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's look here just a second. Let's, let's go back over here to the share. Um, and I don't have the whole chart here, but I have this one enough to try to show you um, at the point of contact and feeling, you are still in the anatomy of the human being. And, and the truth is, it's impersonal. You're not making it happen. What do I mean? Do you make your eyes see something? Do you make your ear hear? Do you make your nose smell? Do you make your tongue taste? Do you make your body feel something? And the answer is no. So all those things back there are basically impersonal system operations. Do you agree that the optical system is part of the anatomy of a human? Or the olfactory system of the nose or the auditory system of the ear or the oral system of the mouth or the physical body? You have to. It's impersonal operation. But something happens at craving. At craving, personal links are happening. And they start with, I like this. I want this. I move towards getting attached to it. And what is attachment? You can't think about anything else except the handsome man you just saw at the mall or the beautiful girl who walked by on the beach. You can't work today. You are attached with something in your head that you can't stop thinking about. That's your papancha, that's your mental proliferation going on. And it keeps you away from being here in the present moment, okay? And just paying attention to what you're doing at work. So that's contact happens with contact as conditioned feeling arises and the feeling we know is part of the operation of the body too and can be determined through equipment in the emergency room to tell if a person is having a, a um, you know, a um, pleasant feeling or a unpleasant feeling. They can go that far with the equipment now. So when we get to craving, everything changes. And this is the red zone. Personal links mean I like it, I want it, mind. And that's where the tension starts, the rising tension. And there's where the emotion is happening between, it bursts out right between the craving and just like halfway into the craving very quickly, this, this opinion comes up and you have the rising of the tension that moves into something that is named. So how do I get away with saying feeling is not emotion? Feeling is just pleasant or painful or neutral. But all the emotions, think about them, they have names. Happiness, sadness, worry, fear, stress. All these things are conditions, emotional states and conditions, and depression and anxiety and t the tension that comes into the anxiety, which moves into the depression, which can move into other diagnoses beyond that, all of these things are labeled emotional states that we can't climb out of. Why can't we climb out of them? Because we believe with a different, pers with the wrong perspective. This is me, this is mine, it's myself, this depression is my fault. I am to blame. It's part of me. I'm a bad person. That's where we go with it. But none of that's true. It's not true. It's only because you don't understand the difference between how all of this works in cognition is what we're trying to look at. Okay, so we need to go out of here. We cut, whoops, I wanted to go back there. Uh -uh. <laughs> Come back into here. Okay. So it's the personal opinion that's going to get us in trouble. Our usual way of describing this is saying craving is the I like it or I don't like it mind, immediately followed by the link of 
fleeing, which then proceeds to explain to us, why do I like it? Why do I not like it? And by the way, you might check at that moment, is it from the past? Am I gonna spend my time all day in the past now? Or is it in the future? Am I gonna worry, 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 and not be able to work that way? So that disturbs us too. So if we identify these things knowing what it is and that it is an imperfection in our perspective of how things work, it's an imperfection in our way of looking at things. And when, once we catch that, we can step away from it. We can counter it. Each time you run a story in your mind about the ideas, concepts, opinions, assumptions, and imagination about why you like or dislike something, the tension and tightness increases more and more. It compounds in circles, keeps running around on each thought piece that comes up in your mind. And this moves us further along the line of cognition from feeling into emotional states. The emotional states lead us into picking a reaction and then the reaction comes alive. Uh, it, is this where myself comes in? Oh, Q, yes, this is where your I, me, my, mind comes in. The I, me, my, mind, there should be a little dance about that. The I, me, my, mind, I'm going to leave at home. Boom. <laughs> Something like that. We should have some kind of sound. The I, me, my, mind has got to go away and bloom somewhere else. Not with me. Leave it all alone. We should get some lyrics going here, okay? <laughs> so you come in and you just grin at yourself if you understand. But Q says this is where the ego first arises and gets bossy. I said, yeah, we've had talks about that. I believe that's what's happening. Uh, what is happening is me. I am starting to get into this instead of watching how it's working. This is who I am, I say. What's happening is myself, the equivalent of taking very personally uh, like this, uh, jumps in the way of seeing clearly what's actually going on the actual going on. And this is where we mistakenly take the unessential, that's the unessential, slipping into I, me, my mind, okay? This is where we mistakenly take the unessential part as being essential in a situation instead of only seeing the essential as the essential and responding to it when an event is happening. You see, an event is happening. Um, you're driving along the road and there's an accident. Are uh, you going to get out and help if you can, if there's nobody else around, are you? Or are you going to sit in the car and wonder what might happen in the future if you do? Or might remember something, your sister did something, your brother did something, and somebody smacked him on the hand or blamed him for something. You don't want to take a chance, so it's in the past, so you're get, this must be like that. No, 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 no. This is right here, right now, a karmic gift for you. The karmic gift for you is are you going to help the person, and when this happens to you, somebody's going to help you, or are you just going to stay in the car and drive by? What are you going to do? Person falls down in the street. Are you going to help them up or are you going to leave them there? This is, this is the questions always coming to us. And they go, what, what goes around comes around. What you put out, you get back. You hear all these funny sayings in every language. They're there. So what you put out, you get back. What goes around comes around. So what are you going to do? set up your future or just walk away. So this is where we get mistaken about this. We talk about, that's why Bonte wants you to always say the uh, unessential. You want to work to see the unessential as the unessential and the essential as the essential and stay with what is happening in the present moment. That's what that verse in the Dhammapada, that's what it means, okay? Is this why craving is at the root of suffering? Yes. If we step back and observe what is happening, seeing it as it really is, we can give ourselves the space to decide how to respond to a situation correctly. 
But if we are taking the situation personally, our minds are cloudy and we are likely to just react to it based on the fact that it feels like very re-stimulating, just like something, uh, the same as something that happened before to us in the past. And so we just react. Sounds like this could be a problem for people in relationships and interactions. Who is that the understatement of the year? <laughs> Quite so it is. But most people remain ignorant of how all of this works. They are never informed about how this actually operates. And therefore, they cannot see how letting go, relaxing, and impersonally observing what is going on could help us understand what is happening before we respond. And the thing about this paragraph is it should say also, we don't get this in high school. And somebody who's in charge of choosing textbooks for some reason, they want us to look at a sick stomach, a headache, you know, they want us to look at a broken arm and chest, uh, you know, uh, what do they call it? Having gas in your body or having heartburn. They want you to look at that. They'll teach you about all the basic systems, your heart and your blood and your lungs. But mind you, don't learn anything in high school usually from here up. You don't learn anything about this head like the one that's behind me. You don't learn anything about that. I love this statue. This is from Anchor Wat. And it just goes to prove that the Buddha went to what was most important. He went to the mind and to the head to get the answers. He didn't dance around the whole body and do exercises with the whole body and all of that. He went to the source. And this always has reminded me of the fact that they wanted to get this across with that. Of course, the tree, it grew, grew around it after they made it, so we don't know what's underneath, but anyway. Most people are ignorant of how this all works, and that's the secret in Buddhism. We want you to know how it works so you can let it go. This is exactly what ignorance is about, the root word here being ignore. And what is being ignored? The impersonal process is being unconsciously ignored when you're growing up. This is nobody's fault, though, because no one ever told us about it. So you see, ignorance simply means unintentionally you're ignoring and not understanding how the Four Noble Truths work and this process of dependent origination in human cognition and also most people they haven't had the opportunity okay to to have the three characteristics of existence pointed out to them and q jumps up says okay what were those three characteristics again they are impermanence anicca suffering the dukkha and the impersonal nature of everything anatta Sometimes these are called the three marks of existence. Oh, I remember now, says Q, the suffering or unsatisfactoriness is caused greatly by my taking personally what is going on and the impermanent nature of everything increases the levels of tension if you don't remember it. And even it causes the stress and even depression. That's right. You got it. And craving is the trigger point that sets it off. The so solution is to let go and relax, smile, and come back to what you were doing. Keep going with a smile. And once the brain learns how much more comfortable this is, it's going to begin to do the steps automatically. So keep it going. You're actually, it's a form of light kind of brainwashing yourself to understand how everything works. And you say, well, why can't I have the answer today? Well, how old are you? <laughs> you have to ask the question, how old are you? I was 50. For 50 years, I watched people struggle and fight and argue. And I saw you know, villages and towns and cities arguing. And I saw all kinds of things in my life. 
And none of those people, they just watched each other. And when you watch the protests from the 60s, you watch everybody does what everybody else is doing. Nobody is independently being careful or being civil or looking at the system. You know, in our country, we have a right to have a protest with civility and debate. It's in our constitution. What we're watching is not protests, but it's riots. And there's no civility about it when you come to someone on the street and say, you have to kneel down before me and agree with what I say. That's not a debate. So what exactly is happening? I don't know. I'm going to stay here with you guys. So let whatever is arising, just be there. Stay with your object of meditation. Smile through it and let go of all attention and tightness after emptying out precisely as the Buddha instructed and relaxing the mind, then come back to your object of meditation with a smile, proceed onward with a lighter mind. Life will get a lot lighter if you do this for a few days. So I'm gonna give you an exercise this week. It's a simple exercise. It's time to experiment. This is what all this was about. When we were doing it on the mountain, we would work on one of this for a few days and then he would just say, go out and do this exercise when you're working in the woods, when you're cutting wood or moving rocks or building roads or <laughs> you're moving uh, anything you're doing all the time. It's time to experiment. Take some time this week while you're living life and see if you can notice when something annoys you <laughs> and how there is an increase in tightness in the head and the body. And if this is a distraction for you, then just never mind it and smile and keep going through it or forgive yourself and forgive the distraction quickly and let it go, relax, smile and come back to whatever you're doing. See if you can notice the difference when you do the release, relax, you do the relaxed smile. See if you can notice the difference when you let it go and you smile. And then when we come back, report back what happened. The next time we are going to search out and find uh, the clinging and look at what's involved with this clinging step all the different things that can happen, what it's doing, you see? And once we get through this line this way, we turn around and look back and at one time, we show you how a person heals. How does a person heal? Not by examining this forward and backwards and forward and backwards. Obviously, it's not working. Sometimes I've been in groups where, wow, What's happening here? <laughs> it's not, people are not getting along so well and having a lot of trouble and saying, no, we're learning so much, but it's hollow. So we have to first work at seeing how each one is happening and how it gets aggravated and how it goes through the process to the end. Then when we listen to what the Buddha says in the whole thing, in his description of these pieces, we can really relate to it when we hear it in the suttas. And that's really what my job is to help you so that when you listen to Bhante, when you're listening to me and we work on things like this, we're learning the parts, we're learning how to hear what it's like in the text when you start to listen to the suttas when he's teaching, you start to see, oh yeah, that's there. Oh yeah, that's working that way. You start putting it together. And you begin to get familiar in a special way with the places and the different monks that were teaching and what their habits are and what they were doing and who was listening and what happened here and there and everywhere. And so that's really special. It's really fun. So I've been talking for a while and I need you to talk back to me. Do you guys get what's going on with the craving? Is there, are you, are you, experiencing how this is working when you're going through life. I know Deep is shaking her head, yeah. <laughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. 
May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.